So good evening, everybody. I'm Nancy Lomi Bow. I am the program director at Cancer Support Community in Redondo Beach. Um, today we are presenting our second topic of our 2021 programs through the South Bay Survivorship mm -hmm. Consortium. So today is a joint effort and a collaboration, which um, we are so grateful to have a relationship with. The people who make up the South Bay Survivorship Consortium come from Torrance Memorial Medical Center, the Torrance Memorial Physicians Network, which is Cancer Care, uh, California Hematology Oncology Medical Group, the American Cancer Society, Beach Cities Health District, Kaiser Permanente South Bay, and Harbor UCLA. And we began meeting in 2009 to provide survivorship education in the South Bay. And this makes it our 12th year um, since we started providing actually in 2010. Today's topic is grow your own easy organic gardening and healthy eating. We're presenting this different take on the topic of nutrition because we get a lot of feedback from our participants requesting the information on healthy uh, eating. And our goal tonight is to provide you with ideas on how to create and maintain your own organic gardening, no matter how small or large your space is. Um, and also to learn more about incorporating organic foods into your diet. Our presenter, Judy Gerber, is an, ex an expert, and I know we're going to learn a lot from her. Um, so first, I just want to touch on a couple of housekeeping items. Um, one is please um, make sure that your microphones are muted during the presentation. And that if you have a question, you can use the chat function. I'm going to be watching and monitoring the chat. So if there's something that is very on the moment, I will bring that up with Judy. But otherwise, the majority of the questions um, are going to be asked at the end of the presentation. Um, we have some handouts on the topic, and they're going to be posted on the website at www torrencememorial.org uh, slash SBSC. And you'll see I put that in the chat to everyone um, if you want to write down the web page where you can revisit and get the handouts that we refer to. Um, they cover gardening tips, including small, small space gardening, what to plant now, which would be the period of and local and online gardening sources for seeds and other supplies. Um, tonight, instead of a sign-in sheet, we're using the participant list that was generated when you logged into the program. So if you logged in um, and your name is something creative, uh, such as a nickname, or if it's just a phone number, please let Miriam Slavin know by emailing her. And I put her email also in the chat. Um, I see, I see uh, <laughs> Greg Ann just put, this is me in the chat. That's great. Then Miriam can, um, you know, make note of who different people are. But her web, her, I'm sorry, her email address is up there, miriam.slavin at tmmc.com. Um, and then the other thing too is that we have evaluation forms and those are really important to us uh, on the South Bay Survivorship Consortium Committee because they really help um, bring attention and awareness to what you want to hear more about. So the evaluation forms, they're going to be mailed out to you in the next week or two along with postage paid envelopes so you can easily mail it back to us. Um, so please, uh, like I said, if you can um, mail those back, we take note and we actually will try to bring you the next presentation based on how you ranked what you'd like to hear about. Um, I see someone's putting in the chat, can I replay, repost the uh, email address and the website? And I will do that as, as soon as I finish introductions. So sorry if you're unable to see that, I will put those up again. 
Um, let's see, our next program is going to be at 530 on May 26th, and I'll tell you what we have lined up. We have Dr. Nicole Alexander Spencer, who is a primary care doctor, but she focuses on and her specialty is integrative medicine. So she's going to be talking about the use of supplements and vitamins. Um, and in addition to her medical training, she's completed a fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona under Dr. Andrew Wheel. Um, so just to tell you a couple of things in regards to who we need to thank, all the consortium members and volunteers who helped tonight. Um, and of course, we're so grateful to have Judy here as well. So I'm gonna read a little bio about Judy and then we'll get going. So she is a University of California certified master gardener since 2009. Judy joins us tonight to talk about organic gardening and healthy eating. Her road here has been interesting and she says she is proof that you don't have to have been a gardener or done it from childhood. Anyone can garden. Judy Gerber received her master's degree in public administration from Cal State Long Beach and began working in local government with the city of Torrance and the US bankruptcy court. Finding that these were not satisfying, she started volunteering in the community and started freelance writing on the side, eventually serving as a city of Torrance library commissioner and as a UC master gardener. Today, Judy is a freelance writer who writes about sustainable farming, local food and gardening. She's contributed to over a dozen books, including The Farmer's Al Almanac. Judy's writing credits include co-authoring From Cows to Concrete and as the author of Farming in Torrance and the South Bay. In tw 2007, Judy was the City of Torrance 2007 Excellence in Arts Literary Arts Awardee. Several years ago, Judy offered to teach some gardening related classes at Torrance Memorial to get some Master Gardener hours. And that led to a writing relationship with the Medical Center and her creation of the Torrance Memorial Medical Center Garden Program that now includes classes, leasing a Torrance Memorial Community Garden plot through the city of Torrance and maintaining organic gardening boxes around the Medical Center. <clears throat> Excuse me, post COVID, Judy plans to extend her teaching and gardening work by involving the food services department in gardening box growing of their own organic foods. Uh, and in her spare time, Judy's a volunteer for Food Forward and a Torrance Memorial Historical Society board member. <clears throat> Please welcome Judy Gerber. Thank you, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay, so now I'm going to share my screen. Um, hopefully this works. It worked when we practiced. Can you see the slideshow? So basically, thank you for that wonderful introduction and for inviting me. Um, I'm always thrilled to talk about gardening as we were discussing before everybody got signed in. It's definitely been an interesting year not being able to do classes in person. So I'm thankful to be able to do this and at least talk about the benefits of gardening and as uh, Nancy mentioned, I was completely not a gardener and I didn't become a gardener until my late 30s, early 40s, and now I'm addicted to it. And it's been very therapeutic for many reasons. So I just thought I would go over some of the tips that I, I talk about, um, how to make it easier regardless of space and how it can, it can heal you in so many ways. So um, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. So basically I always like to remember um, how things work in nature by using some of my favorite quotes. The, the, the lovely Miss Audrey Hepburn was, was an avid gardener. And I like the philosophy that planting a garden is believing in tomorrow. And one of the things that I'll talk about later on that I'm gonna to touch on right now is that when you're out in the garden or even out in nature, you tend to forget about everything else and just focus on the here and now. So that's a really one of the biggest benefits. So as Nancy mentioned, um, I've been leading um, a garden program at Torrance Memorial uh, since 2009. So we have been fortunate enough over the last couple years to have been gifted money from a local garden club. The Riviera Garden Club donated some money. These two boxes here that you see, 
This is the health education building. Those of you who have taken our exercise classes at Torrance Moore will recognize the building. Um, my husband is a gifted, skilled uh, craftsman and he built these with us, for us. And we had one, this box here on the right, we put in in 2019 in April. The one here on the left, we put in last uh, August during the pandemic with funds that the Garden Club donated to us. And these are larger than you could put in your backyard, but they're sort of um, indicative of even without a space in the ground, you can use something even one quarter the size of this and grow plenty of produce, even with a small patio. So these are a little couple um, close up photos of, of the garden boxes that I took last week. You'll see here um, on the top, this is the newer box. And I'll talk a little bit about it when you talk about planning your garden, but you need to think about your space and what is there and sunlight. So even though these garden boxes are intuitively, we think they have the same growing conditions yeah. because they're right out front. Don't forget to move the cars tomorrow, yeah? Um, they actually have some different conditions because they're a little bit shadier. So this is some new lettuce that I planted last week. These are some ornamental cabbages here. These are beautiful Swiss chard. And I just take different angles to sort of show uh, what it looks like. Uh, this is the box um, on the um, closer to the Lobita Boulevard side, the one that gets more sun. So you can see at the bottom photo, look how tall this uh, yellow Swiss chard is. And the back here is the red Swiss chard. We have some chives growing. We have some kale growing. We have two kinds of parsley, flat leaf and Italian leaf parsley. And here in the left, we have some flowers growing because unlike at the community garden plot where we grow, we don't have a lot of other things growing that attract the pollinators. So we need bees and we need birds to come to pollinate what we're growing. So these are just different views. So here's our garden plot that we lease from the city of Torrance. We have been growing in ground here since 2012. Um, these are four raised beds boxes that we have put out there. Um, we have grown rain, shine nonstop for the last, what is that now, nine years, that's hard to believe. And these are boxes that um, during the pandemic, I stopped growing as much out as out there as I normally do because I can't have students come out and I'm hoping that that ends pretty soon as we all get vaccinated and we get underway with our um, herd immunity. But out there we have growing and this little corner here is a beautiful purple um, cauliflower. I have some more kale. I have different broccolis. The middle box I am growing different flowers again for pollinators. We have a herb garden. We have our own compost bin. We also designed this garden so that people who were going through physical therapy or other rehabilitation, if they wanted to come out and work with us, you could actually drive into this garden and, and get access. So that's uh, something that you also want to think about when you're thinking about gardening, that you can pretty much grow with modifications if you need to. And the other piece of it is that this is one of my favorite sayings. Um, if you notice the on the left, I have a friend that I've met through the garden writing world. Her blog is called Kiss My Aster. She's very humorous. And she always promotes the fact that you don't have to be good at gardening for gardening to be good for you. And that's something that as a master gardener, I was trained to teach people and I was trained to learn that the goal is not for everything to be perfect, but that you'll have a little bit more success because success breeds success. So if, after I talk tonight, hopefully I'll motivate you to at least want to grow a couple um, of your own things. It doesn't have to be a lot. It, it helps to have a, a couple things. And once you start growing, you may, may find you wanting to grow more. So why should you grow your own food? First, this is important to a lot of people, especially those that are mindful about what they eat, whether it's organic, whether there's been chemicals put on your food. Um, as a master gardener, most of us are kind of control freaks and we are taught to grow from seed to the end of life of the plant. And by doing that, you know exactly what's gone into that food from the time that that seed has been sprouted till it dies. So you know whether or not your food is truly organic and how it is grown. So that's something that's important. If that's important to you, that's just one reason. The other thing that's been shown by having farm fresh or actually garden fresh produce, there's actually more nutrients in fresh from the garden produce. There's um, a disadvantage to having, even though we live in California and our state still produces over half of our fruits and vegetables, even having it trucked in from the Central Valley or even from up north or down south, it loses some of its uh, nutrient value in the transportation, but 
picking something literally that day or two or three days ahead and then putting it in, you'll get the most nutrition that you can from that particular uh, vegetable or fruit and it adds to your healthy eating. Um, this is one that's sort of kind of out of order, but I keep it in here. One of the things that I've learned about uh, gardening is that it's not just good for me as far as eating, but it's good for me as far as providing me with a low impact form of exercise. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes, but it's a, a great way to get some, not only fresh air, vitamin D, but it's to get your, mo your movement in. The vegetables and fruits that you grow in your own garden are fresher than almost anything else that you can get. Unless you have your own farm, having your own garden is like having your own mini farm. Things are fresher and you can pick them when they are at their freshest and at the best possible time to pick. A lot of things that are picked to go into supermarkets are picked not necessarily for freshness and taste, but because they do better over transportation, over days that, that are required for transportation in order that they don't get bruised. So they may not be as fresh and they may not have the best flavor. Speaking of best flavor, there's nothing more enjoyable than a fresh from the garden tomato or uh, fresh from the garden cucumber or even some fresh herbs. If you, if you like to cook and experiment, you can pick your own herbs, you can dry them for later. I mean, the potential for um, what you can do both in your kitchen and if you are somebody who likes to craft or likes to grow your own herbs and things to make your own soaps or to make your own candles or anything like that, there are so many advantages to growing your own uh, vegetables, flowers, and, and herbs. The other piece of it that people don't often think about is that it lowers your food costs. While some people wonder why can't I just buy a Dollar Tree or, or 99 cent you know, seeds at the 99 cent, there's nothing wrong with buying those there. They may not all germinate, but if you spend a little bit extra money to even buy the $3 or the $4 pack of seeds, the number of seeds that you get will germinate will be far greater than anything that you could buy from the farmer's market or even from the supermarket and it'll be a great uh, cost savings. Um, for me, one of the biggest benefits of gardening and growing my own is the reduction of stress and anxiety that I find when I'm out in the garden. Um, there are a lot of things that I didn't like about gardening at first, which is weeding. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later on, but for those of you who wonder, if, you're, if you grow organically, organic gardening means that you don't use any chemicals, you use everything that is plant or animal based. And if you garden uh, organically, you tend to weed by hand or to use products that aren't so harmful to you or the environment. So I find that weeding is one of the most biggest stress reducing things that I can do. And it's ironic because I resisted it for years. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the healthy eating component, sort of what Nancy was talking about. Um, how um, healthy eating is, is a really big benefit of gardening and there's other health benefits as well. So how does it promote healthy eating? Some of this may be obvious, but I, I tend to forget it. So I like to remind myself, um, aside from literally, excuse me, <coughs> having better nutrition through the healthy eating, gardening has not just been helpful to what you eat, but it, it actually lowers cholesterol and blood pressure by providing a low impact exercise, excuse me. It's been shown to lower blood pressure and it's been shown to lower cholesterol. Um, so it's another benefit that is often hidden that we don't think about gardening as exercise, but it is. The other thing is if you have been instructed or if you're trying to eat better, you get a, a, a little bit more variety and you get more control over what's going into your diet by, you have, by having a direct supply of fresh, healthy produce instead of relying on what may, may or not be available or in season at your market or your farmer's market by starting your own seeds or even your own transplants, you'll know exactly what you're going to have. If there's something that you typically cook with or there's something you particularly like, um, the last year has definitely shown us that we can't always count on those things being available at the supermarket or even at the farmer's market. So by starting your own produce, you have more control over what you're growing and what you're eating. It tends to increase your healthy diet by having that control that also contributes to a healthier diet because it gives you more diversity in your diet. Um, you know, we hear a lot about the eating your five colors or sometimes it was seven colors, whether it's the purples and, and the dark leafy greens and the yellows and the oranges. Sometimes we aren't sure how to get that and we aren't sure where to find those items that we like that maybe provide those nutrients and antioxidants. So by growing the things that offer those different things 
uh, in their nutrient content, it gives us a, a bigger variety uh, and a more diverse choice of uh, healthy ingredients. Um, this for me, I found particularly true. If you grow what you like, you'll actually eat more and have a healthier diet. Uh, I was never ever a fan of cauliflower. I actually did not like it at all until I started growing my own. And one of the things that I mentioned is that when you can harvest things when they're at their freshest, if you wait for something to get super big, it may become pithy and bitter. It may not be its freshest, it may not be its tastiest, but when you harvest things when they're the most tender, when they're at the ultimate uh, number of days that they're supposed to be at to taste the best, it, it definitely makes a huge difference in what you'll eat and how often you'll eat it. Now I eat broccoli and cauliflower regularly. I'm still working on kale for my, my own palate, but some people adore kale. Um, the other thing that it, it does is, especially if you start later, I never had the habit growing up of eating enough fruits and vegetables. And I, I try to admit this to people because they think, oh, it's too late. You know, I'm almost 60 years old. And for me, it's never too late to start eating the things that you want to eat to feel better. And you get in a habit. And because the things taste fresher and they have more, you have more variety in your garden, it makes me want to get in that habit more and more every year that I do it. So those are some of the ways that it promotes healthy eating. The other set of benefits that gardening provides us is it's a whole body exercise. It's a low, like I mentioned, it's a low impact exercise and um, it increases our flexibility, our endurance and our strength. 45 minutes of gardening is equal to 30 minutes of low impact exercise, sort of a, a, a walk, maybe not a hard walk, but a walk that you, can just, can, that you consistently do for about 30 minutes. And it involves different kinds of exercises depending on what you're doing. Um, different seasons, you might not want to change out the garden. If you're growing in ground, it might require more working out. So you need to do things like maybe weightlifting and, and stretching and moderate cardiovascular working out, depending on if you're composting, depending on if you're weeding. Um, so there are things that you can do with the garden that maybe you're not really keen on doing uh, other exercises, this will help you do them. Um, it, you know, weeding, digging, and even harvesting, you, you use many different muscle groups. It also increases your, um, muscle and bone health, the bending and the stretching and using your hands can help increase your flexibility, um, your balance and your strength. Um, that's something that's been very important for me because as Nancy mentioned, as a writer, I spend a lot of time on the computer and I've been known to have a lot of pain in my right hand using the mouse so much. When I get out in garden, I use muscles, I strengthen my hands. Again, you wanna make sure that you, you, know, you do things safely and you wanna take care of yourself while you garden, even though you wanna benefit from the exercise. So you wanna make sure that you, you, know, you are safe, that you stretch, that you listen to your body. Um, just because that entire one raised bed is full of weeds, it doesn't need to all be weeded in one day. So I'm encouraging exercise, but I also wanna encourage you to do it safely, right? Um, make sure that you wear gloves and goggles and long pants or anything that you need to, to be, be safe. Make sure you wear sunscreen, closed toe, toe shoes and hats, especially if you're using sharp tools, be, be mindful. Uh, make sure you have, you know, all the things you need out there and make sure you can keep hydrated while you're out gardening. Um, so yeah, this one was a real, um, benefit to me that you can burn almost 330 calories in one hour of light gardening and yard work. Well, some of the yard work is not exactly fun. Sometimes raking leaves isn't that fun, but you can break it up between um, raking, maybe you can do some harvesting, maybe get a couple of those tomatoes or a couple of those uh, leaves of kale or broccoli, depending on the season that you're working in. So some of the best, uh, most um, active activities you can do to work your muscles and burn calories are moving compost, digging holes for transplanting, weeding, and raking. So those are some ways that it benefits us physically. Um, so the emotional benefits, this piece for me has been an unexpected joy. Um, and particularly in the last year, um, aside from COVID, I've had several close friends and a family member who've been very ill. They're all thankfully very, very healthy right now, but it's been a, a godsend for me and a refuge to have my garden. There have been numerous studies that have been done that shows that gardening is positively correlated with reducing stress and anxiety. 
In fact, um, there was a, a man, Roger Ulrich, who studied at uh, University of Texas in Austin, who did a study of patients in the hospital. Even if they had a view of, of the greenery outside versus just a view of a wall, they tended to, to heal quicker and, and need less pain medicine. So nature and greenery has been shown. That's what horticultural therapy is all about. There's a whole practice of horticultural therapy. Um, even though sometimes weeding and sometimes the bugs or critters eating your plants can cause stress, it actually is very relaxing and reducing your stress. There's nothing like being out in the garden and enjoying the sounds of nature, working in your plot and, and working in your favorite flowers or your favorite veggies, and just looking at, at, at the, the sunshine. Plants are calming, therapeutic, and soothing. There's a whole thing about um, all sensory gardens. You can have gardens that the gardens for senses where things have a, a great smell, where if you rustle certain things, they have a great sound. That contributes to the soothing nature of gardening. And you can incorporate a lot of these things that aren't edibles into your garden. We'll talk a little bit about that when I talk about the steps, how to start a garden. Um, for me, this is the biggest benefit. It totally allows me to unplug and slow down the pace. Aside from using my phone to take photos in the garden, I don't use my phone. I just ignore any messages and I just focus on whether it's, whether it's planting, whether it's fertilizing or weeding or harvesting. I focus on that task and it allows me to breathe and slow down. You know, we tend to go from thing to thing and forget about what we're doing. Being in the garden really teaches you that you can't always do that because gardens only grow as fast as they're gonna grow. Um, it also provides us with self-sufficiency and control and self-esteem. One of the greatest senses of satisfaction is to take something from a seed or a young plant, to raise it up, to grow it, to harvest it, and to either cook with it, or to either put it in a vase, if you've got flowers, or to give it to other people. It also uses something that you don't think about, but it uses your sense of creativity. Creating a plant palette with different colors and different kinds of plants. Looking at your garden as a whole plan. How are you going to plant things? How is it going to look? That allows you to use your creativity in ways that you normally may not be able to use. You wouldn't think about it. Do I need something with more uh, red color or orange colors? I have found over the years, there are certain colors of flowers that I tend to plant because I like them. So it's allowed me to express my creativity in a different way by sort of shaking that up a little bit. As I mentioned, gardening can teach you how to have more patience. Mother nature does what mother nature is going to do. Plants can only grow as fast as they're going to grow and everything has a season. Even though, and I talk about this a lot in every class I teach, even though we live in Southern California and we can grow year round, we really aren't supposed to be able to do that. Everything has a season that it does best in, whether it's cool season or warm season. We have overlapping seasons here and that makes it a, a, a great place to garden, but it also makes it not possible for you to have as many tomatoes in the cool season. You shouldn't even be able to grow tomatoes. So that's why it teaches you how to work in tune with nature and to be more patient and be ready for when it is tomato season. So this is basically my overview of how it's good for you. And the next step is how to actually start an edible garden. And I'm gonna go through each of the steps and then as Nancy said, as we go along, if we have questions or if we have questions at the end, I'll be happy to answer them if I can. So the first step, make a plan. So I tell everybody, every class I teach, I'm basically a lousy, a lousy, not lousy, a lazy gardener. Uh, that was quite a faux pas. I'm a lazy gardener, but I like to plan ahead so that I can be a lazy gardener when it's time to harvest, when it's time to grow, all I have to do is, is go out there and enjoy my garden. So you want to think about um, what kind of garden do you want, right? Do I want edibles? Do I want veggies or herbs or both? Or do I want fruit? How do I do that? Do I love flowers? Do I have to have them separate? I know that there are a lot of people that are rosarians. They, they grow roses or they grow... Um, fuchsias and they, the never the two shall mix, the, they're always separate. But when you grow an edible garden, there are a lot of uh, edible plants that are actually beautiful flowering plants, but that also can be benefited by combining them with flowers because you want to attract the good bugs and detract the bad bugs. So you can make it a combination. 
The whole point to remember is there's really no right or wrong way to do it. It's your garden. So design it how you want to. And we'll talk a little bit about when you plan your garden, it depends on your space. But you know, do you prefer flowers? Do you want annual flowers that are gonna bloom one season and be gone? Or do you want perennial flowers that are continually gonna come back? How do you plan for that? When do you plant them? Um, you know, you need to think about what you're going to grow. So this is an example of some uh, pictures of some of the garden uh, pictures I took over the last year at our community garden plot. Uh, on the left here is a beautiful uh, snapdragon growing in front of a ruby red Swiss chard. The Swiss chard benefits from the bees that come from the um, snapdragons and the colors just, I didn't know how they would look and I just think they look beautiful together. And then here's the ruby red Swiss chard that, that just keeps coming. And you know, those are things that as we do classes, we talk about, well, when's the right time to harvest? Is it too big? Is it too small? Those are things that you can think about as you start planning your garden. So what goes into planning? First, be realistic, right? Do you want to spend a fortune? Gardening can be uh, one of the cheapest things around. You can recycle items. You can do everything from recycling your, um, did you go to Trader Joe's and buy a salad and it came in a plastic container? Well, you can go ahead and use that to start your seeds. Or you can go, and one of, the, one of the handouts Nancy mentioned, I did a, a list of resources. You can go to Garden Supply Company and spend a fortune on a specific seed starting kit. How much time do you have? Do you only have um, two hours a week? Do you have five hours a week? Do you have time every day? We'll talk about it a little bit at the end. You wanna think about one thing that gardens need is pretty consistent care. Do you have time? Do you have space? What do, and this is something you need to be honest with. Again, it's your garden. What do you and your family like? There is no sense planting. Um, I, I can't even believe that this happens in classes, but I always ask every class what they like. And it took me about five years of teaching before somebody actually admitted, I don't like tomatoes. Most people, they can't get enough tomatoes. And I'm like, well, okay. Or they don't like zucchini or they don't like, like me, they're not a big fan of kale, even though it's one of the best things for you. So you need to be honest. There's no sense, even though I'm a lazy gardener and I'm going to go to all this trouble ahead of time to plan, there's no sense for me to plant something that I'm not gonna eat, unless you're growing it for other people. So you think about it, what do you like to eat and can it grow here? Once you research, can it grow here? What season does it need to grow in? How much space does it need? If you have, uh, a garden in ground plot, then you, you can either plan a garden plot and draw it out. It doesn't have to be a big, fancy, you know, completely accurate plan, but just to give you an idea of, okay, even if it's a box, it's gonna be this big, I wanna draw it out because you wanna think about things. What kind of things grow taller? What kind of things, things grow shorter? You're gonna have to think about that when you think about your needs. The other piece that makes it confusing about our weather being so good is seasonality. Plan ahead for the seasons. So a lot of our big box stores and even our nurseries like Armstrong Nursery, they will push out flats of come in right now and you can get $20 and you get a flat of tomatoes or a thing of zucchini or in the fall they have these beautiful colored, you know, autumn colored plants or even autumn colored trees. The time to plant those isn't when you see them blooming. The time is months ahead. So you need to think about, okay, if I wanna grow pumpkins, that's, that's my best example. You wanna think about if I'm gonna start a pumpkin from seed, how teeny tiny is that pumpkin seed? And if I want a jack-o'-lantern, how soon would I have to plant that? So the answer is, just so you know, is no later than June 15th, you wanna get your pumpkin seeds in the ground if you wanna have a nice pumpkin for uh, October. That's just in general, if everything goes well if the weather cooperates and we have all of our normal seasonality. So you wanna plan ahead depending on what you're growing. The other thing is make a schedule. What is a cool season crop? What is a warm season crop? Do I like, I love leaf lettuce. I can't get enough salad in the summer, but leaf lettuce is not happy in 80 plus degree heat. It hates it and it will wilt and die. Are there alternatives to that? How can I make a schedule so that I can fit that into my particular garden plan? So those are just kind of personal examples that I'm sharing with you with my garden plans. This again, keep a garden journal. It doesn't have to be a fancy journal. It could be a notepad. One of the biggest perks about our smartphones is there is a feature on there called notes. 
So for me, because I go between three different garden sites, I make a note, what did I do that day when I was in the garden? What look, what's eating it? Did I fertilize? Did I water? What did I plant? When did I plant it? When did I replace it? When did I harvest it? You might wanna take notes just so that when you go to analyze things, because sometimes things may happen, you can at least know that I went through these steps and I did this right, what happened? So the first part of planning is picking the right, this is probably the biggest thing that you can do to have more success in your garden. Now, whether you're in ground or even a small patio garden, you need to pick the right location. That means a lot of things. One of the things about either flowers or vegetables is anything that fruits or flowers needs at minimum six hours of full sun a day with some exceptions. So the cool season crops, because we're in March, we're still in a cool season. The warm season crops haven't started yet. So even a cool season crop will need full sun as much as possible. So the, the, the thing that you wanna think about is where do I have that? If I don't have that space, what can I plant in a container? What kind of container? When you make your list of the things you're, you're gonna eat, you can look at how much sun that actually needs. Again, to go back to my favorite leaf lettuce, that is kind of an exception. Lettuce can get away with maybe four hours of sun a day and it doesn't have to be afternoon sun. But what else is in that spot that's blocking the sun that's going to need the care that your other plants need? Is there hardscape there? Is there a patio there? Is there a building? Are there trees? What can you move or what what is there that you have to live with? What's the terrain like? So if it's a patio, you have a little bit more control. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but um, containers, you can get um, bottoms, you can get wheels for containers and you can move them around. But if you have in ground growing, or even if you have a patio and there's no sun, there are some things you may be able to grow, but you need to look at that before you plant. So you wanna think about what kind of terrain is there? Is it level if you're growing in ground? Is it on a slope? What else is growing beside there? Are there trees there? What about the water source? How does it, how does it drain? How about the wind? If you plant alongside the house, is that gonna be a wind tunnel? If you plant at the bottom of like a canyon, how's that going to affect things? This number three here, soil, Unless you're planting in containers, I would argue that soil is probably more important than, than even sun is because soil provides all the nutrients that your plants need. So you want to have a good soil. And again, that is an entire class, but I'm just wanting to point out that um, soil, you, you can either have your own compost, compost, you can buy bags of soil, you can have soil delivered. But what you want to do is look for something that, that feeds your soil because basic garden soil in your garden is usually just dirt. If you notice, I use the word soil versus dirt. That's how you know somebody's a gardener because they call things soil instead of dirt. But dirt is something that doesn't have any nutrients in it that just, that just is not going to help you have much success. You wanna make sure that you, what's called amend or feed your soil. So think about how you're gonna do that before you do anything. We talked about sunlight, it's, it's a hugely important thing. Convenience, this is the other piece. If you're growing things in your garden to eat, to, to put into your kitchen, one of the things that makes a, a container garden such a, a valuable asset, a kitchen container herb garden, you if you have the sunlight right outside your garden, right on your patio, all you have to do is go right out there, pick what you need and bring it in. Um, so how convenient is it? As I mentioned, you want to think about consistent care. If your garden is too hard to get out, if there are too many things in that terrain that are in the way, you're not going to go out there and garden. Part of the convenience is the water source, right? How are you going to water? Is there a spigot? Do you need to uh, make a drip irrigation system? Can you do watering cans? Think about the convenience to both getting to the the work area. Is it easy to walk around? But is it easy to get to the water water source that you need? Um, the other thing that I tell people is I don't care. It doesn't matter if you have a lot of space or if you have no space, start small. So just because you have an acre, you, you don't need to have somebody come out and get your acre already and then plant. That's overwhelming. If you pick two or three things of your favorite vegetables to, to eat. So our boxes here on the left at the community garden, these were from last, um, last year. 
I, I don't always have all of them going depending on what season it is and what's growing. But depending on what you want to grow, you may only need, you know, um, one eight foot box or six foot box or two or three containers that you can experiment with. And once you figure out the things that are a little easier to grow, and I have a list of those at the end, once you get um, the feel for the soil, the sunlight, then you'll know that you can go ahead and increase. Once you start gardening, then you can always add. <laughs> so kind of related to that is if you are limited on space, you don't have a lot of, uh, you don't have a garden space, you have a, a small patio or a balcony, containers can be your best friends. And basically, I think what we also put on the website, the handout talks about container planting and small space gardening is you wanna look for things that do better in a container. The size of the container is what matters. It doesn't matter what kind of container, as long as the container is wide and deep enough for the root system. All the things we talk about when we care for plants is, is important to know that we're talking about caring for the root system because everything grows from those roots. So if you fertilize and water, if that root system has enough to grow, they'll be able to provide you with all the produce you need. So when you look for things that you wanna grow in a container, if you've got a deep enough container, this isn't as important, but if you're limited on your space or size of containers you can put on your balcony because you can't put big containers out there, you wanna look for varieties that have patio size or small or have the word dwarf in them or container size. Now the vegetables themselves will not be smaller size, but the plants which take up the space in the container will be. So that doesn't mean you're gonna get cheated on having you know, dwarf sized vegetables. Um, even one of the examples I use is even if you grow cherry tomatoes in a regular garden, those tomatoes are small. Those are those little tiny ones that look kind of you know like grape size. I had grown one year a cherry tomato plant. The plant itself was probably 10 feet, 10 feet wide. So it is not the size of the fruit or vegetable that you're concerned with. It is the size of the plant. So the other way you can take advantage of having a sunny spot but not having a lot of space is to do two different crops. So plant a crop that comes in early and a, a crop that comes in later. Like I mentioned, right now we're in spring and it's still sort of the cool season of vegetable growing. And again, one of the handouts on the website talks about what to plant now. Some of us are starting our crops that grow well in the warm season, but we're still growing cool season things that grow quickly. So things, for example, like lettuce and carrots and radishes, you can grow those now and you can grow crops that are going to go a little bit later that grow that take longer to grow like tomatoes and and green beans in the same spot and they will by the time those radishes and lettuces are done your other crops will be coming in you can same principle with the interplanting the flat fast and slow growing vegetables if they grow in the same season something that grows a little bit faster you can put them under those plants that are taller that grow a little bit slower and you'll still have both crops for as long as you need them. The other thing that I use a lot, even in a bigger space is something called succession planting. I use it a lot for lettuce and different greens. So for most people, if you're like me, you like salads, 12 um, lettuce plants throughout a season and you can get um, a good season would be three to four months worth of lettuce. But like I said, if you go to the nursery and they're saying we have a whole flat of lettuce on sale, plant them now. If you plant all of your lettuce or all of your tomatoes at the same time, what's gonna happen? They're all going to be ready at the same time and then come three months from now, you'll have nothing left. So if you space them out, plant one crop this week, wait two or three weeks, plant the same lettuce three weeks apart. There'll be different sizes, one will be ready sooner and one will continue through the rest of the season. So succession planting is your best friend when you have a small space because you can use them to keep things coming in. The other thing to make space more uh, usable is using vertical crops, things that grow up like vining peas or vining green beans as opposed to bush green beans. Even things like zucchini and cucumber, there are varieties that you can grow up. You can put against a wall or even in your container or box, you can do like a trellis or a wooden, um, even wooden poles to have something train up in and grow up so that it gives you more space so that it doesn't take up the whole container. The other prep step is, is preparing your garden site. This is really particularly more important for somebody growing in ground. 
the first thing you need to do, and I need to do this now, is we've had a winter, we've had wind, we've had rain, you need to clean up your site. So you need to get rid of any old debris, you need to get it all ready. If you're really, really interested in having the best soil possible, you can either have somebody come out and do a soil test for you, or you can go even at, at Home Depot, at Lowe's, or even at Armstrong, they make um, a soil test um, kit that you could buy for like 10 or $20. And then you go ahead and, excuse me, amend your soil. And whether you're growing in ground or in boxes or containers, you want to prep. So say you have containers and boxes that have sat around all winter, clean those out. Um, the one good thing about containers or boxes is you can buy something called potting mix, you know, potting soil that's all pre-made for you. You can either keep some of the old soil in there if you think it's wasteful to start new, but put some new in by prepping and amending that soil. The next step after prepping and planning and thinking is selecting and planting or sowing your, your crops. Now, normally in a class, I ask for a show of hands, how many people will grow from seed and how many people would grow from transplants? And most people in most of my classes, when I ask, are you, are you intimidated uh, growing by seed? I get a lot of hands raised that I'm afraid of seeds because seeds are so small and you don't know what you're doing. One of the things about seed packets is there's a lot of valuable information on the seed packet. The seed packet tells you how, uh, when it's to be planted, how far apart to plant them. The other thing is um, I even have handouts, you know, if anybody ever takes a class on how long seeds actually like. Seed companies are in the business to make um, money. They produce seeds every year. If you keep them in a cool, dry, dark space, they'll last. But sometimes people ask me, well, they don't all germinate. They don't all germinate. So um, that's something to think about that, you know, you want to think about when to start them, how long it takes to germinate. These will tell you it takes how many days, how long before after the seed germinates, is it ready to harvest? That's the part of the thing when you're thinking of your planning, even if you're not going to start from seed, when you're at the store, just go ahead and read a seed pack and count back the days. Oh, okay, if I want to plant this now. The other most important thing about selecting your crops is make sure you're planting in the right season. <laughs> so if it's a tomato, you want to grow it in the heat of the summer. If it's a melon, if it's squash, you want to grow it in the heat of the summer. So when do I need to start that? You don't want to start those um, too soon, but right now our weather are typically our temperatures, you know, in the, in the warm season are 10 to 20 degrees warmer in the evenings than they are in the cool season. So the things that you like, when you made that list of the things that you'd like to eat, then you can research, okay, what season does it grow in and how long is this going to take? Um, it's really important to know because it, it won't be as disappointing if you plant in the right season because you'll have more success. So number one rule is consistent care. So one thing that I used to do before I started learning more is I would go out and I would water the garden, just water it and just drown it. And then I'd wait and let it dry out. And then I would water it again. So it was like, you know, it was like on a roller coaster. The plants didn't get consistent care. You need to keep mindful of how much that garden needs to be watered, how much it needs to be fertilized. The first thing to think about is using the right tools, whether it's the right shovel, whether it's the right trowel, whether it's the right, and they make all kinds of tools. Now, again, you can spend a lot of money or little money. They make tools that are ergonomic. They make um, rakes and hoes that are long handled for people that have uh, maybe arthritis issues, back issues, or that have some issues. Um, the other thing about uh, consistent care I mentioned is aside from irrigation is feeding the soil. You want to make sure that you keep that soil well fed and, and some things when you plant and we talk about this in our classes, things like herbs you don't need to fertilize. So where would you, where would you plant those? If something needed a lot of fertilizing you might want to put your herbs in a separate spot. So you want to think about how often to feed the soil and make sure that's what the garden journal and the notebook is for. When did I fertilize? I can't remember that, but oh, look, I wrote down that I fertilized last month. The other piece of it I talked about is irrigation, watering, right? The right amount at the right time of day. In containers, you want to keep that container consistently moist, almost like a, a wrung out sponge. In the ground, how do you know that it's, it's watered enough? They make a thing called a moisture meter that goes down um, about 
oh, the length of a ruler, it goes to the root system because again, we're feeding, we're irrigating, we're caring for the root system. So I also put on here right time of day. I always ask this in class too. What do you think is the best time of day to water? The best time of day to water is usually in the early morning for many reasons. Number one, we always have an afternoon breeze. It's so reliable that our local newspaper is called the daily breeze. So in the morning, when you water, you don't have a lot of water waste blowing in the wind. If you water, the best place to water is at the root system. But if you water overhead and you accidentally get your foliage wet, that might maybe make it more susceptible to bugs. If you watered earlier in the day, it has all day for that foliage to dry out, to be ready for the evening. If you work during the day, that's not a possibility. The second best time is late in the afternoon. The worst time to water is when it's hot in the middle of the day. This is the other thing that some people love it or hate it. I have a friend who loves waiting. She's asked me, even with COVID, well, if I wear my mask, can we socially distance? Can I come help you weed? Um, we have known each other since high school, and I don't remember her being such a fan of weeding, but she loves it. But it needs to be done. Why? Aside from it not looking good, weeds compete with the plants that you want for nutrients, for sunlight, for water. And a weed is basically anything in your garden that you don't want where it is. Um, certain things will self-seed, like every year I have flowers that are beautiful, but the birds will move them or the wind will move them and they'll come up somewhere I didn't plan them. So I either put them where I want them, I accept them or I weed them out. So you don't want the weeds, all the time that you take to plan out your garden, you don't want the weeds to compete with what's growing. The other step is pest control. And some of the things that we talk about in our classes is how to make your plants healthier so that they can withstand pests. I was just telling the ladies before we started that at our garden box at Health Ed, some big critter, I don't want to know if it's a skunk or a rat, is taking out big chunks out of our Swiss chard. So short of me being out there hunting him, I have to figure out how to protect those plants. So you want to think about the consistent care of not ignoring your garden by going out at least once a day and seeing what's going on. Say you have bugs coming or you have something being chewed up. If you catch it early enough, you can stop it from spreading either on that one plant or to other plants. So it gives you a little bit more pest control by having consistent care. The other piece about maintaining the garden that you need to be consistent about is cleaning up and harvesting. Now cleaning up, you know, some people avoid, but one of the things that might surprise you is a lot of people, like I said, will do is they don't harvest on a regular basis. Your plants need to know that they need to keep producing. If you stop harvesting, it's gonna to go to seed and stop producing. And, and the other time, a lot of the time too, if you grow things that are too big, like I mentioned, it changes the, the flavor. I, I like kale better when I harvest it younger and more tender. Zucchini gets too hard when it's too big. Um, same thing with pumpkins, unless you're gonna grow a pumpkin to enter it into the Half Moon Bay pumpkin weighing contest, it doesn't have to be bigger. That's not always tastier and healthier. So basically those are the simple, well, they sound simple when you just talk about them, but the steps to gardening. So as I mentioned, if you wanted to start now, these are some of the easiest crops to start. Lettuce um, and carrots, carrots can grow even during, even though they're cool season, if you plant your carrots and carrot seeds, by the way, like to be started directly in the garden, they don't like to be transplanted, they do best. So say you wanna get ready for summer and you wanna to plant tomatoes and bell peppers in the summer. If you started carrots now and then planted your tomatoes around them, the shade of those carrots, the carrots will get the shade from the tomatoes and the peppers. Spinach and Swiss chard and lettuce are all in the same family. They're all leafy greens. So this here on the bottom left, these are some of my favorite. These are oak leaf variety lettuces. The one here is a green one. The red oak leaf is a very nice, mild tasting lettuce. This one here is a ruby red Swiss chard that, chard that just keeps producing. So that's those. And this is one of our biggest harvests from a couple springs ago that we, we got over at our learning garden. Here's some broccoli. These are all cool season crops. Here's some cauliflower. Here's some of those. Um, this is red sales lettuce, one of my favorites. Here's another green variety of lettuce. 
Um, we had enough salad to, I had about six people helping me that day. We all had enough to take home with us. So you wanna make sure you consistently harvest. Um, and this is, this is something that I can keep up for a while, but I think this is also on the handouts. These are some of my favorite sites. Um, I'll just go over them briefly and then I, I think I'm finished. Hopefully I've made some sense. Um, the first one is the, is the Master Gardener program. So we get hours by volunteering, helping people grow their own food. Some of my fellow Master Gardeners love to find answers to people's problems. And so they have all kinds of information and things on this first website here. Um, and they also have handouts that the University of California, our parent campus is, is UC Davis, not UCLA. And so they do everything from, they have handouts on what to do about snails and slugs to gophers, to what do I do about um, aphids. My other favorite uh, sites include some of my favorite seed companies, Renee's Garden Seeds. Her seeds are available at most local, um, at Armstrong and other garden centers. Cornucopia Seeds, she no longer is available at, at Orchard Supply, they closed, but I go to her online. Botanical Seeds, they're all available at Armstrong. Um, another place that you can learn a lot more, LA County has a smart garden program and they teach you how to compost. I think now they're doing it via Zoom, but normally under no COVID, they have two sites, one where our community garden is at Columbia Park and the other at South Coast Botanic, where if you go and take a class, the classes are free, but they also sell the compost bins at a discount. Um, Armstrong Nursery, they have all kinds of helpful hints for you. And then the other thing is myfrugalhome.com. The woman has offered free all these handouts of how to um, do car, kind of charts and tables and things if you really want to have an organized notebook. So that's basically the sites. Um, I think that was it. And then this is my last uh, quote. Gertrude Jekyll was a wonderful British gardener from the Victorian era. It, it teaches you patience and carefulness and watchfulness. And it teaches us trust because once you get out there and do everything you, you're supposed to do, then you have to trust that nature's going to do what it's going to do. Um, and then last but not least, this is my contact info that we can leave up. Um, hopefully I didn't go too long. No, I think that this was perfect. Thank you so much for all of this, Judy. It's really great information and hopefully it's inspiring some of our participants to uh, do some organic gardening. We did have some questions though, Judy, are you up for answering some of the questions? Do you want me to stop sharing? Sure, that'd be great. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the first question, somebody was asking about the address for the Lamita garden that you um, perhaps mentioned. So it's 3105 Lamita Boulevard. It's the Health Education Center. Um, and you'll be able to see our boxes once you pull in there. You can see them from Lamita. Okay. If people want to get in touch with you, then that, that last slide with the information, your information, mm -hmm. um, people can find out more about how they can garden at the different sites. Um, yes. So, you. I mean, I, I have a Torrance Moral email, judith.gerber at tmmc.com. That's the easiest way. Okay. Um, but I, I mean, there I Go ahead. No, should I put, I mean, if I put the last slide up, do you want me to put it up there? Sure, you can put that last slide up. Leave that up for, for a minute or two for people to take okay. down the information. Okay, what else do we have here? Um, I, I did get a couple of questions that came uh, directly. One was asking if you had any concerns about planting or working under the power lines. You know, we get, I get that question a lot. We, our garden is under the power lines. I've been out there since 2012. I don't, I mean, I've heard different things about it. Um, so far, I haven't had any, there hasn't been any real studies that UC has done that has made me have greater concern than I would. So, um, you know, it's, it's definitely something that some people have issues with. So far, I haven't found, found anything uh, definitive saying it's particularly dangerous. Okay. And then how do you deal with go gophers or <laughs> other pesky uh, rodents? Uh, well, gophers are evil. Um, 
<laughs> you know, you could do, they actually make um, like chicken wire, they actually make wire that you can put in uh, before you plant that deters them. Um, when you get when you get the handout that talks about the UC site, they actually have um, an IPM sort of outline on what to do about gophers, short of having somebody um, come out and get rid of them. It, that that seems to be the best thing that works is, is trying to block them having, or you know, if it gets really bad, you can also, even though you're in ground, you can maybe put something above on the ground and use it as more of a box. Um, they are very stubborn. Mm. Um, there are some things that I can't always answer because I still deal with them myself. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're persistent, as you said. Yeah, they are. Okay, and we have a question here. What do you do if your vegetables are small? Well, that could be a lot of things. It could be not enough sun, not enough fertilizer. It depends on what you're growing. Um, I, yeah, it depends on um, what season it is. I mean, usually if there's not, a, I mean, if there's not enough, I always forget that different fertilizer have, you know, have fertilizer of different nutrients, whether it's phosphorus, nitrogen, and so forth. Um, depending on what you're growing, it may not have enough nutrients. And sometimes if there's not enough sun, they won't grow big enough. Mm -hmm. We have a question asking about heirloom seeds and wondering if you can uh, tell us more about them. And uh, this particular person just found out about them, so she's curious. So and they call anything an heirloom that's at least 50 uh, years or older. So a lot of the sites that I have on my list do use heirloom seeds. What you want to think about is that an heirloom seed that has, you know, that, that that reproduces. There's nothing more frustrating than a seed that doesn't reproduce the same way. So say you grow something like a tomato that's an heirloom tomato. And by the way, tomato mania is an event that happens every year. If you, if you Google it, they um, are at different sites and he sells over 350 varieties. They were going to do um, some sales at International <laughs> Garden Center. But so if you think about heirloom tomatoes, you grow a certain kind of tomato because you expect it to have the same taste every time you plant those seeds. So if you look for something that's an heirloom that's in our area that's done well, those are seeds that you might wanna find and get. Um, they reproduce true to the parent. I mean, certain things, just because something is hybridized doesn't always mean it's bad, but they're not always heirloom. Um, what's happened with hybrid, hybridization has that it's gone all, you know, way off the scale. But if you look at something that's an heirloom, um, it will be something that will produce the way you want it to. And so like Renee's has heirlooms, Corticopia, I think Botanical Interest has heirlooms. And there's another company that is on the list of our handout that is now, oh, wait a minute, I think I printed it out. The name is escaping me because my brain is full, but there's a lot of, um, oh, Baker Creek Seeds. They do a lot of heirloom varieties. And those I believe are on our, our list. I don't know if that answered the question, I hope so. Okay, um, there's also a question about tower gardening. So um, tower gardening, so tower gardens, they grow in, they don't use soil, they, they grow in, they use a formula, it's a liquid formula. And in fact, I had the, the great awesome opportunity when I was working on my last book to go to um, one, of the flower, one of the vegetable farms in downtown LA that grows in a warehouse in the arts district and they use tower gardens. Some of the greens that you go with, if you've ever eaten at Tender Greens, they used to have towers out there. That's the same principle that right now, because they're considered hydroponic and they're not, given the certification of being organic, they, uh, because they don't grow in soil, they're starting to study that. But I have never used them. I know people are very happy with them and they are, they're a good alternative. Small towers can run from what I understand between three to $400 and you have to get um, their formula or figure out what the formula is. I've never gardened in them, so I couldn't tell you what you buy, um, but they are a good alternative. Um, to outside. I mean, I think that you still have the same issue that once the plants come out, you still need the sunlight to grow them, uh, depending on what you're growing. So, okay. And now, um, now we have a question: Can you water after 7 p.m.? And I, I suppose they're asking, would it be wise to water after 7 p.m.? I mean, it would be if if you're going to water later in the evening, just be mindful as as much as you can to 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 keep like I have. I should have brought it in the office with me. Um, it's like a little bubbler. It goes on the end of my hose, 
and, and it goes in the ground and the water doesn't, I don't water overhead. So if you're watering in the evening, try to make sure you either get a drip system or have something on your hose where you're watering as close to the soil as you can so that you're not getting the foliage all wet as much as possible. But it's better to water when you can than not water. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, and somebody is asking, can you recommend a burp less cucumber? Oh yes, my husband does not, He and me too. I, I get a lot of um, heartburn when I eat cucumbers. One of my favorite burpless uh, are just actually basic, a Japanese cucumber. Um, it's I cannot remember the exact name of it. I'll try to think about it, but I know Renee's garden sells some and they are the best thing. They're very tender, they're easy to cut and they are really good. I just wish I could remember the exact variety of cucumber, but um, any, most Japanese varieties of cucumbers are burpless, if that helps. Okay. Um, we have a question here. Any other ideas of things that would help for people who have bad arthritis, but want to garden? So I know you the, mentioned one thing, but you have other ideas. So the, the, one of the things about the boxes, and it depends on your arthritis. I mean, I have arthritis in my elbows and my hands. So I use smaller, lighter tools, like child size tools. Also, if you have arthritis that's in your back or your knees, my dad has real issues with his knees. Um, that's one of the things about having a, a waist high, either a waist high box or even something like if you have a shortage of space, it might help both issues. You could put them on, there's nothing to say that you can't put your containers on a table so that you don't have to bend, that you don't have to use, you know, your joints that are bothering you as much. Um, the lighter containers that you can get, the better. And, and the ergonomic tools, I don't have a list of, of any right now because the company I used to recommend doesn't make them anymore. But anything that is designed to uh, be more ergonomically you know, efficient or anything with a longer handle makes it easier to use because you don't have to use as much strength. So those are my, my tips. Okay, let's see. Any other questions that anybody has? I think we've gone through the question, so I'll give just a moment if anyone else types anything else into the chat box. I see a thank you. Thank you so much for the answers. Oh, I did answer. Sometimes you never know if you get the answer or not. Well, that's the one thing I learned as a master gardener is I, I'm better like if you give me a question and have me come back to you. They told us one thing we learned as master gardeners, that I know where to find the resources, even if I may not have that answer right away. So that's why I give out my contact info. If it's something that I didn't quite answer, I'd be more than happy to research it as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, it looks like we have, oh, when, when watering, uh, i.e., uh, I guess, tap water. So it sounds like someone's asking, is watering always tap water from the hose, I would imagine? That's what I use. I just use my, my water in the backyard or at the community garden. We have a spigot out there. And though at, at the uh, Health Education Center, I actually use the spigot outside the building and I use uh, watering cans. All right, well, Judy, thank you so much for spending your time with us tonight and educating us about organic gardening. Um, you gave us some really great tips and um, tools and these handouts, just as a reminder, they will be available on the website that was um, posted above the www.torrencememorial.org slash SBSC. Um, and it probably should take Miriam about a week or so for the video to post. Is that about right? I, I would say like a week and a half from now and we'll be good. Okay. And are the handouts already up there or will they go up when the video goes up? No, actually what I will do is I'll post the video and I'll, I'll post the handouts on Friday. So they okay. should be up next week, but the video won't be accompanying it for, well, who knows? My, the long range plan is next, the week after next, but it could be Friday. I, I have no idea. Okay. And please don't forget about those evaluations. They'll be form, uh, sent out to you and they'll have those uh, stamped envelopes for you to send back, but those really are so helpful to us. Um, and again, Judy, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah. Hopefully everyone will get some gardening in this weekend. <laughs>